Is that working? Okay, so next up, um, we have Matt, who is a lifelong entrepreneur. He has uh, developed many products, and probably more importantly, he's helped um, countless marketers become successful online. So Matt's going to be sharing with us some an introduction to selling clothing online, some of the processes, and really what it takes um, to be successful for you guys to come online, and if you already are online, how to sell more and how to become even more successful. So Matt, take it away. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good. Whoa. Just give me a second to uh, write my presentation real quick, and we'll get started. Good, good, good. I'm going to step down here if you guys don't mind. <clears throat> so, yes, my name is Matt Stefanik. Thank you guys uh, for being here today. Um, I'm going to basically be just be covering the basics of the t-shirt business and uh, how we see it and what we've uh, kind of viewed th this business to be over the last uh, year that we've kind of been working in this space. So uh, nothing too in-depth, but I think this is a good presentation to get things started. T-shirt biz basics by uh, Chris Blair and Matt Spanik. My partner Chris will be up uh, later today. If we were both up here together, I would not get a word in edgewise, I promise you. So. A little bit about me, in case some of you guys don't know me, which I find hard to believe, but I'm sure there's some people in here that don't know me yet. Um, if you find my fan page on Facebook, you'll see that I'm a super fancy marketer, a serial entrepreneur, Sam Squamp skeptic, unemployable weirdo, and other fun things, which is always fun. Uh, has everybody had their coffee yet? Just, like, let's wake up. Uh, before, actually, I wanted to say a couple things about coming to events, like two things last year in 2014 that helped us double our income from the previous year were live events and private coaching. So getting yourself to these events is critically important. The connections that we've made just in all around the world, visiting these events, meeting people, um, I think meeting people is probably a lot more valuable than what you're gonna learn in the room today. So make sure that you, you know, touch everyone and make connections because those will really help build your business more than the how-to stuff. Okay, like, uh, like I said, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. Uh, I've been self-employed since 2002, so for the past 13 years, I've not had a job, which is great. So I get to sit at home and work at my office. Uh, I dropped out of college, actually, in 2002. I was there only to play basketball. That didn't work out. So I dropped out and thought this would be a perfect time to get involved in real estate investing. So I did that with no money, not even a cell phone. Uh, I actually didn't even have a website back then. Uh, just started flipping houses and you know, that went really well. Our best year, about 2006 when things were going really well before the, the crash came, you know, I used to flip houses and make checks like this. As you can see, these four checks alone were right around $100,000 and these were just a couple of my bigger ones from 2006. <coughs> things were great back then, uh, doing real estate, thought that I was gonna do that forever. And then of course, living the dream, feeling good. The next year, I don't know if you guys know what happened in 2007 in the US real estate market, basically crashed and uh, we lost everything. We had a lot invested in real estate. I had three houses go to foreclosure, had my car repossessed, uh, sold everything I owned and yeah, that was a real tough time but that's kind of part of what you'll find in most entrepreneurs story. There's that uh, story of you know, overcoming and kind of dealing with a lot of crap to get to where you, you, know, you know you're gonna be. Uh, so literally we had to pick up and moved on. We moved out of Florida, moved to North Carolina where I still live now. Started a couple other businesses just utilizing my real estate experience and expertise that I had and did some foreclosure inspections, low mods. Yeah, I think that was on the other side there. Guess not, sorry. Okay, so anyways, I know uh, some of the presentations we've given are in the IM space. We talk about selling t-shirts and some people are like, you know, t-shirts, like I can't believe people actually sell t-shirts online. It sounds pretty ridiculous when you think about it. And it is, it's, it's absolutely absurd the amount of money that we can make uh, selling t-shirts online. So the t-shirt industry, 
a lot of people are skeptical about where it's going, but if you consider these graphs, by the way, my wife said, whatever you do, don't put charts and graphs in your presentation. Well, I got charts and graphs. <laughs> So if you look at this uh, trend here, clearly there's, a, there's an upward motion to this trend in the t-shirt business. And if that doesn't do it for you, I've got this one too. Notice there's this relatively small part down here, surprisingly insignificant part there. There's a mathematically incorrect part, and of course this significant part is where we want to focus our time. This clearly indicates, no, I'm just kidding. Obviously I could not find any meaningful stats to support like where the t-shirt business is going, where it's been, and why we think we're going to continue to make a lot of money selling t-shirts online, but trust us, it's working. There's a lot of people that you're going to hear from are making a lot of money in t-shirts. A lot of our students are making money in t-shirts, and uh, we're excited to be here and be able to uh, share this information with you today. Okay, the t-shirt business. It's, it's a very unique business compared to a lot of things that we do online. Basically, all we do is, is we flip money. Um, we want to turn one dollar into at least two dollars, right? We want to make at least 100% ROI. So the more money we can throw at ads and continue to get that positive ROI, um, the better off we are. So we just basically flip money. We never see the product. We don't have to deal with customer support. We just, we're the, we're the marketing arm for the t-shirt manufacturer. So that's what we think of ourselves as. We're marketers, okay? We're not t-shirt sellers. We're not physical product sellers. We're marketers. We market these products for the manufacturer. We connect them with buyers. That's our job and that's what we get paid for. <laughs> there are pros and cons to this business, of course, like any other business. The, I think the easiest uh, ease of market entry in, in the t-shirt business is what makes it so desirable. A lot of people searching to make money online. There's a lot of you know, uh, glitzy and glamorous looking things to make money online, but t-shirts, you can see that there's a lot of new people, a lot of new marketers that are making money with t-shirts, so it's just, it seems like such a low barrier of entry. Uh, you really don't need much money to get started, which I'll talk about in a minute. So there's a low cost barrier. Um, don't need really any experience. You can literally buy a course, kind of apply that information and start making money with t-shirts. It can be a high profit business. Um, I think when Chris and I got started, we lost on our first 17 campaigns or so, somewhere in that range, uh, trying to figure it out. Didn't make any money, but once we had that one good winner, that's all it took to kind of wipe out uh, all of those losses. And that's all you need. And you know, you have to keep that in mind. I think a lot of people getting started, they get discouraged because they're not uh, making money at first. But you know, just keep in mind that that one good winner can really just wipe out all those losses and uh, put you on the plus side really quick. Um, the pros capitalize on events, trends, seasonal sports, and popular topics. Um, this is an unending source of niche ideas and opportunities to sell t-shirts, um, especially with the seasonal things. Birthdays, obviously, are a daily thing. Uh, you know, seasonal things like Mother's Day and uh, Father's Day and Christmas and, and things of that nature, uh, Valentine's Day. You know, you can capitalize on these every single year. And the Internet's really such an evergreen, you know, uh, industry as it is. So you're going to find a lot of new people to... Uh, to market to all the time. Shirts can definitely be evergreen. We have shirts that uh, we continue to sell. We've sold them multiple times. We're in the teens, the high teens, maybe low twenties. With the relaunch of some of these shirts, we just continue to find new new uh, targets for these shirts, and so we just keep keep selling the exact same shirt over and over and over again. Uh, of course, we have seasonal styles, as you guys probably know, tank tops, uh, hoodies for winter, regular t-shirts. We generally sell mostly shirts. We've been selling a lot of hoodies lately because of the weather. So, and that's, again, a, a yearly thing. Every single year, you're going to get to do that same stuff over and over again. It's definitely a good cash flow business uh, because of the relatively quick payouts, uh, especially if you're using like something like Facebook ads and you have an account that where you're, you know, you're not paying them every day anyways. Um, we have certain thresholds that once you reach a certain amount spend, then you get charged. So this really only happens every once a week uh, that we get charged. So we could actually be selling shirts and know what we're going to be making and uh, get that money returned to us pretty quickly. Again, we don't really have to do anything other than the marketing side. We don't uh, deal with the personal support. We don't have to deal with customers and refunds and complaints and quality issues and things of that nature. We don't worry about packing and shipping. 
uh, real any obligations other than just uh, portraying the product to be what, exactly what it is. And that's an easy job. So, you know, again, this is a very interesting business and it uh, can be a lot of fun. You really don't need a website. You don't need anything. I mean, these platforms today, they allow us to do everything we need. I mean, it gives us really everything we need. Facebook ads and a t-shirt platform is really all you need. No autoresponders, you don't need your own hosting, you don't need a domain or special software. You can literally get started with, with next to nothing, just a small advertising budget. Um, once you get going, this can be partly outsourced. Uh, a lot of what we do with the t-shirts is outsourced uh, from the designs, the graphics, a lot of the setup and stuff that's kind of just busy work can easily be outsourced. Um, that's one of the pros, of course. And with Facebook, it's so easy to target your audience. I mean, they make it really easy to locate your prospects on Facebook and target them with ads. And I mean, there really is endless shirt ideas. I mean, we get uh, our shirts stolen, which is one of the cons I'll talk about. But it's not too upsetting because there really are endless shirt ideas. I mean, even within one single niche, you can find multiple shirt ideas and continue to sell ideas after ideas in the same exact niche over and over again and never run out of ideas or shirts or you know opportunities there so it's this is a really a huge market and as much competition as you see out there it's it's not even nearly enough to uh, make it saturated not even close okay of course there are cons to this business as well you really can't be a total idiot I mean you need a little bit of sense about you know I guess that goes for any business that you you get into but you will find that because of the low barrier of entry, you will find a lot of people that did not get this first bullet. <laughs> and they're just jumping in and throwing stuff. I'm sure you guys seen uh, shirts in your newsfeed and how just <laughs> awful they are. And even more surprising is when they're selling, you're just like, oh, no way. Get out of here. <laughs> it's a little bit labor intensive. I mean, kind of the busy work is not very labor intensive. It's just. It's a lot of setup, uh, especially to kind of figure everything out and uh, you know get your designers to produce good designs and get all the ads set up and you know manage the fan pages and you know that sort of, again that stuff can be outsourced, but at first you kind of need to dig in and get all these parts moving. This is a big one: uh, the copyright infringement. We've we've had a lot of our friends you know trying to grab that low hanging fruit and sell sports. Sports is such a bad idea, if you ask me. Uh, we've yet to get into any kind of sports niches, uh, specific team niches. It's easy to sell football or you know baseball general niches to like soccer moms, like my kid's a soccer hero, whatever. But individual teams, um, I know a lot of our friends are making a lot of money, and I know uh, some close friends that are making six figures a month still with t-shirts, but the things that they have to do to go through that, they're really setting themselves up and, and risking you know, lawsuit, and we just don't think that's worth it. So we advise you guys definitely stay away from sports uh, teams. They will come after you. Eventually they'll find you no matter how many times you, you know, rotate IPs and change your domains and set up new accounts. It's just not worth it. Um, and you just never know. I mean, this could be retroactive. They could come after you two years from now and say you sold, you know, a couple hundred shirts uh, to our fans with our copywritten, you know, logos or colors or team names or anything of that, of that nature. Again, our, sh our shirt designs get copied exactly. And, you know, that's okay. It's nothing we can really do about that. We do, like, try to keep our designs hidden. We try to keep our fan pages hidden. We don't want people stealing our shirts exactly. Although Chris and I do kind of uh, get inspiration, I'll say, from other t-shirts. Um, so, but we kind of make it a point not to rip that shirt exactly as we see it. So we might see a, a saying or a slogan on another shirt, like, you know, if you're ever traveling, you just walk across a, a t-shirt uh, store and you're like, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to take that one. So, but we just take that idea and, and, you know, use our own fonts and colors and things like that and uh, just find ways to uh, uh, target those shirts. But that, that does happen a lot. You'll see our exact, like they literally just took a screenshot and put it on their own shirt. So that's always fun. And that doesn't bother us too much because if they're that, you know, kind of that first bullet person, then they're probably not going to have much success anyways because the targeting, when Chris is going to talk about how we dig into the targeting, makes all the difference. Um, we've had a shirt that we ran and our buddy ran the exact same shirt. It was, uh, it was eerie that it was like almost the exact same 
a little bit different design. We both had the same idea at the same time. Uh, we sold, we outsold him by a lot. And that's thanks to Chris and the things that he's gonna share with you with the targeting because Chris was able to dig down into those niches and find those targets, those little hotbeds of buyers and we just, we just blew him out of the water and he stopped selling it because he was pissed. <laughs> okay, this is a big one. Um, Selling shirts, definitely on Facebook, it's, it's constant engagement. I mean, you have to re-engage your fans. You have to. Uh, this, this helps in a number of ways. Of course, engaging with people is going to keep them engaged, right? And they're going to be more likely to buy, keep, keep reminding them about it. Uh, they'll share it with their friends and family and things like that. But also, those comments, those likes, that interaction, Facebook loves that stuff. And the more that they see that happening, the more likely they're going to continue to show your post. And so... It's, it's definitely an, uh, a necessary evil, but it's not something that we want to be doing all the time, especially when you have 20 shirts at the same time. You know, how do you manage personally all that engagement? It's hard. So there's software that we, we, we use to engage. Uh, also, outsourcing this is definitely big. Uh, this is a very one, uh, easy one to outsource if you get the right people in place to kind of understand how to engage and engage correctly so that uh, we benefit uh, from that engagement. Definitely a numbers game. It's, it's just a tricky business. I mean, again, we've seen those shirts where we're just like, oh my God, what a, what a stupid shirt. You just see it, it's so horrible. Purple with uh, white, horrible, ugly, you know, barely legible fonts. And you're like, there's no way this thing's selling. And then you see a lot of them selling and you're like, that is just nuts. And We've had shirts, the design is just so great. I'm like, oh, this one's gonna kill. Like this design is beautiful, perfect. It's professional looking. It's amazeballs, really. And we put that shirt out there and it's just like a big fat zero. I'm like, what? What the world? Like that shirt over here sells and this shirt looks awesome. And anyways, I think it's because people really have like bad taste. So <laughs> it's true. I mean, like the most people have bad taste. So. You gotta not think like, what would you buy? Because you know we're gonna buy nice stuff. We wanna wear nice things. But the people that are buying shirts apparently have horrible taste, and they love flaunting that. You ever see somebody at Walmart with a with a uh, with a T-shirt from Teespring or something like that, and you're just like, oh, where'd you get that shirt? Facebook, didn't you? Yep, I can tell it's ugly as hell. Yeah, it's not very sus uh, sustainable in that you can't just walk away. This is uh, what I see as the biggest problem with the t-shirt business. It's no matter how outsourced you get this thing, no matter how cranked up you get the machine, if you kind of step back away from it, it's, it, you gotta, it's gotta constantly be overseen. And you know, that probably could, an argument could be made for a lot of businesses out there, but if we walk away from this business, I mean, the idea people, the people that have the concepts and the know-how to make all this work, it's hard to step away from that and continue to feed new ideas into this machine because that's where it's at. I mean, we can crank up and continue to sell the same shirts over and over again, but we still need to bring in fresh new ideas. We need to capitalize on trends. We need to capitalize on seasonal things. And so if, if we step away from that, if we take our you know, mentality out of that process, eventually it's going to die. And it's just not a, a sustainable business model without constantly working it. But for the time being, we're working it, making a lot of money with it, and so, you know, it's not that bad uh, when you think about it, but that's really the, the long-term drawback is just that uh, lack of sustainability. Okay, why people buy shirts? This is just basically what we've learned and what we've noticed from selling shirts over the last year. Um, of course, no shirt, no shoes, no service. People need to have shirts. They put signs in stores these days that if you don't have a shirt, you can't come in. So. People have to buy shirts. They buy shirts all the time. Shirts, uh, you know, that's a, you wash them and they get old and you gotta buy new shirts. And so, you know, people are always gonna buy shirts and that's great, so we can sell them shirts. One of the reasons why people buy shirts though, specific shirts, is to make a statement about themselves. Um, it's really about identi identifying with other people and social acceptance, right? So fitting in with like-minded niche audience. Like when I go to the gym, I wear Ohio State Buckeye shirts a lot. And I find people that are from Ohio and you know, we have something to connect on, right? We talk, oh, what part of Ohio are you from? And we talk about college football a lot. And it's just, 
you know, that's why we wear shirts. That's why we, we wear sports teams a lot because that's identity. You know, we get a lot of identity about where we're from, what we're into, and we really want to be socially accepted with other people that share those same values, same interests, and same uh, hobbies. Social status, um, you'll see this a lot in the profession niches, like nurses. You know, nurses apparently love to show off the fact that they're nurses. Uh, engineers and, and th like things with the high prestige value um, are great shirts to go after, those type of niches, because it does, you know, uh, elevate your status. So people buy shirts to say something about their status in life. Uh, social approval, of course, to be socially accepted by their peers and to express themselves, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, if you, again, if you've seen some of these shirts and some of the expressions and some of the things that people say, I mean, some of the shirts that we sold, I don't think I'm very proud about. Um, I wouldn't repeat the expressions that we sold, but um, I certainly wouldn't acknowledge to my parents that this is a shirt that we sold. <laughs> but it sells, it sells. People want to express themselves. We want to help them do that by putting the phrases that we know that they're going to like in front of them and uh, hopefully get them to buy it. It can be an extension of their personality. Again, may not be a great thing if uh, that personality is not very, you know, uh, I don't know, appeasing. Um, so these are basically the reasons why people buy shirts. Next is apparently a movie by Nicolas Cage and Julianne Moore, which came out on DVD September 25th. You guys with me? This is what's called a pattern interrupt, okay? So to keep you guys on your toes, make sure you're paying attention. I want to make sure that uh, I uh, throw in a curveball. But that's uh, kind of, I, I put this in here to lead me to my next point about the t-shirt business. That's basically what we do. It's uh, pattern interrupt, right? Interruption marketing. We're interrupting people on Facebook. This is our main source of traffic, Facebook. They're not there to buy shirts. They're there to scroll their newsfeed and look for cat videos, right? And pictures of food of, you know, of their friends and see what people are eating, apparently. <laughs> so we have to interrupt that pattern of behavior and put a shirt that they're just like, what? what? This shirt is perfect. It's perfect for me. I mean, Chris was just telling me a story about uh, a shirt. As somebody was really excited about the shirt that they bought. They couldn't, they couldn't believe it was like perfectly for them, like they just couldn't understand how this shirt showed up in their newsfeed just for them. They almost had to buy it. They had to buy it. Because cat videos, food, shirt just for me. Holy shit. <laughs> right? So that's, that was, that's what we're doing. The other, other sites, like if people go on Google and they're looking for funny shirt ideas and they find these websites that have this, you know, then maybe <sighs> they're searching for this and that's a little bit different. But we're going to interrupt those patterns. So interruption marketing, it's important to understand that. Uh, funny alone usually does not sell. We found this out the hard way in the beginning. We came up with a lot of funny slogans and we made the mistake of making t-shirts first instead of identifying our target audience first and then making shirts for them. I want to say that again because it's really important. Trying to come up with shirt ideas first and then find your niche is a really hard way to go about this business. What you need to do first is figure out what are the niches that we can actually target with ads, right? Who can we target? Who can we interrupt on Facebook and put a perfect shirt for them, right? And they're easily targeted because we go into the ads manager. We know we can target them. There's a big pool of them on Facebook. Let's find a shirt that we know that they're going to like, right? Not just a funny shirt, but funny alone. We've, we've tried funny shirts, and I have a couple um, examples here I'm going to show you in a second. It not only has to be funny, clever, or cool. Funny, clever, or cool. Okay, it's got to be basically one of those three things. Funny, clever, or cool. But it's got to re relate to your niche in a very specific way. Okay, so it has to speak to them specifically, and it's got to you know touch a chord, right, with with a, a deep rooted interest or hobby, something that really speaks to them. And then if it's funny, clever, cool as well, it's it's very likely that you'll have a winner there. For example, Jesus loves you. Everyone else thinks you suck. I thought that was a funny shirt. I was excited to, to launch the shirt because it's funny, right? It's funny. Um, but we had a hard time trying to find out, like, who can we target with this shirt? You know, uh, maybe, I don't know, skeptics or agnostic or atheist, I'm not sure. Uh, didn't work. Didn't work very well. So I was kind of disappointed by this shirt. Another one. This is a, uh, one of those ideas that we ripped from another shirt. Um, 
this is just our own font and stuff, and it's the exact same phrase. I'd rather be someone's shot of whiskey than everyone's cup of tea, right? It's kind of a clever saying, right? And we thought maybe people that like country music might like this shirt. Um, didn't sell very well because it didn't really speak specifically to that niche. Like it didn't like touch home deep enough. And it, it might for certain people, but you got to tap into that large pool of people and play the numbers. I mean, to target everyone on Facebook and think that you're going to sell shirts is impossible. It's not going to happen. Okay, so why t-shirts don't sell? Poor design, or sometimes maybe it's too good of a design. And both, <laughs> both have happened to us. We were like, maybe we'll just make our designs a little more crappy, and maybe they'll sell better. Because some of these professional designs are just not working that well. So that's a tough one to figure out. Is the design too good, or is it, uh, or is it too poor? Poor targeting. Um, a lot of people, uh, we've seen our students, they get frustrated because they are going after the easy targets, the obvious targets that you find on Facebook. Chris is going to tell you exactly how he digs into finding those deep targets and the, the targets that people aren't necessarily tapping into on Facebook. And I think that's really critical because everyone's trying to like sell shirts to the, to the obvious targets and then they're competing and then it's just, it's just not working. So poor targeting is definitely an issue with, uh, with sh the lack of shirt sales. Again, funny, funny shirt, just not a passionate enough niche or doesn't you know, sit with them specifically. Misspelling, remember you can't be a total idiot. I mean, we've had students post images of shirts and like, I don't get it. Why isn't the shirt selling? And you're like, you don't get it? <laughs> oh, and we've had perspective, wrong perspectives, right? We've had, I've had, uh, I've seen people have shirts that say something like uh, plumbers, we, I don't know, lay the pipe or something, or they lay the pipe, right? But they're, they're kind of putting that shirt together with plumbers in mind instead of from the first perspective. People are not going to buy shirts. If they're a plumber, they're not going to buy a shirt that says plumbers, they do anything, right? It's not they, it's we, I, we do this. And so it's just like saying, I'm a plumber, right? So we're like, well, there's your problem. You're saying they do it. You know, you're thinking like a non-plumber. You need to think like a plumber, right? We do it this way, whatever. So perspective problems. Uh, the expression is slightly off. This actually may not be a bad thing because sometimes your customers will, will tell you. You know, we've had shirts that have run on our fan pages and we'll get comments and say it'd be better if it said this. That's awesome, right? You're like, really? Okay. So we take the shirt down, we put it up, and we change the expression just slightly and it will sell a little bit better. So uh, especially if it's, if it's a niche that you're not very familiar with, um, you're going to find it's a lot easier to sell in niches that maybe you have a, a passion about or that you're personally interested in because then you're going to know it really well. You're actually going to speak their language. So when you're trying to target niches that you don't really know anything about, like Chris, when we have webinars, he talks about the golf niche a lot. And I try to convince him to change that topic and use a different example because he doesn't know anything about golf. And uh, he mispronounces all the golfers' names a lot. And I laugh and giggle on the webinars at him. So he doesn't know much about the niche. So you know, selling shirts in that niche might be a little bit difficult because he doesn't know like the, the sayings that people will say like on the golf course or something like that. So kind of digging into uh, forums and you know, groups like that online outside of Facebook to find like how people are talking is definitely a good idea to get those expressions correct. High engagement, no sales. This happens a lot. It happens to us and it, this one's kind of tough to figure out sometimes. Uh, we found sometimes in the past that, you know, you have uh, too young of an audience um, or the design is good, but it's just, it's just something about it. It's not like good enough to get people to buy, right? Uh, stay away from young people for the most part. We found that they're very clicky, very clicky. They just will waste your budget in a heartbeat because they're kind of click trained, you know. They grew up with this stuff. They're clicking constantly on, on shirts and everything. They share, they comment, they like but then they don't pull out their card and buy. They're too, too young. We try to target 25 and above, um, and we find that you know, 35 to 55 and that kind of gap there is where you'll find most people are, are buyers for most, for most shirts. Bad fonts, see this a lot. Can't believe shirts that have you know, hard to read fonts actually sell, but it happens all the time. So try to not get too fancy with your fonts. Don't, you know, Make them very, 
you know, curly or cursive or handwritten, just nice simple fonts. Um, we found just, you know, basic, you know, sans serif fonts work really well. Um, black shirts, white text. I mean, it doesn't have to be too fancy or too exotic to, to sell. It doesn't have to have a lot of colors. Uh, fonts is definitely a big one. Make sure that it's very easy to read. Too small of an audience. Um, again, a lot of niches on Facebook. Sometimes they're just not tightly knitted enough. There's not a, a condensed group of people on Facebook where we can actually play the numbers and get enough of them interested in this shirt to buy. You might find a couple fan pages and groups of people, <coughs> niches that uh, you can see them, you can target them, but maybe just not enough to get the numbers that you need to make the campaigns work. And not easily targeted on Facebook. Again, this is something we learned when we started doing shirts and, and started starting with the t-shirt ideas first and then going out to niches. And we're like, well, how are we going to target these on Facebook? We can't really find the niches or the interests that correspond with this particular niche. So hard to, hard to kind of sell shirts that way. So make sure, again, that you're starting with your niches in mind first and then designing shirts for those niches. Started with the shirt idea first, right? So again, start with the niche, find a shirt that's going to sell. Okay, niches and ideas. Um, this is kind of a general list of, of things that you can target. I mean, I think these two are probably the best hobbies and interests and professions. I think that's probably the majority of the shirts that we found, uh, hobbies and interests and professions. And when you can combine two of those, those are often very, very uh, uh, high sales if you can get those shirts to uh, combine a couple of these. Uh, sports in general, targeting parents with kids that play sports is cool. Those are general sports ideas. Uh, sports teams, again, um, love to be able to target sports teams, would love to be able to target their fans. They're easy to find on Facebook, very easy to find. There's huge, huge pockets of sports team fan pages and fans on Facebook. Obviously, they're all over the country, um, but not recommended. Celebrities. Politics, um, definitely, especially we've got an election coming up. Um, this is going to be a good opportunity for shirts. And you can play both sides. I mean, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or whatever, I mean, it doesn't really matter because we can sell shirts to both. And people get real fired up. So I guarantee you're going to start to see a lot of shirts in the political niche uh, over the next year. And you're going to sell a lot of shirts in this niche because it's very, like, deeply rooted, like guttural responses, if you can really pick those uh, hot topics and put those on a shirt and get people all fired up about it, and like, you know, both sides. Religious views is another one. That's kind of one that's just evergreen. I mean, you can really kind of find people that are fired up about their religious beliefs and hot topics, um, you know, that religion comes into play, like, is this a religious issue or is this, a, you know, whatever. Uh, can the laws be passed about these things, like abortion and things like that? Uh, obviously, you don't want to write uh, or, or do abortion shirts. That would be a horrible idea. Uh, but, you know, you get the idea. Trends, memes, and names. Uh, names were very hot. I don't know if you guys were around when people were doing names. Names was, was some of those bad ideas. Some of those bad designs were name shirts. I saw a lady in the grocery store the other day. She had a one of those, it's a something, whatever her name was. It's a something thing you wouldn't understand. I was like, oh, you find that on Facebook? She's like, oh, yeah, I just couldn't believe it. It just spoke to me. It was, uh, my daughter's always saying it's, it's, you just, it's just a something, something thing. So I had to get it. I'm like, <laughs> that's awesome. Good for you. Looks great on you, by the way. <laughs> uh, but Facebook hates this now. I don't know why they've kind of taken away um, the opportunity to sell people based on their name. I don't know why this in particular freaks people out. They don't like it because they don't like their users being freaked out. And so I guess when people see shirts in their newsfeed that has their specific name on it, I mean, I don't see why this is a big deal. I mean, you're putting your name on your profile, right? It's got it's your face. It's your Facebook. It's got your name. Why can't we target names? Oh, it makes me so mad. Like Facebook is just like, oh, right? Like, I want to I wanna just target people's names. That's great because they sell like crazy. Uh, birth years was another one. Um, and they still kind of let you get away with this as long as you're not, like, specifically calling out in the ad itself. If it's in the shirts, um, you can probably get away with that. But, tar you know, 
saying something about their birth year. Uh, again, easy to target on Facebook. People list this stuff. They list their birthday because they want you know 500 of their fake friends to wish them happy birthday on their birthday and say, wow, I can't believe all the friends I have in life. <laughs> so, but targeting them based on that with their sh with a the shirt, they sell. I couldn't believe they sell. You know, like born in 55 or like, you know, all original parts, you know, made, made in 55 or whatever. I mean, those sell. They sell really well. Um, I imagine guys would probably want to wear shirts like that more than women. I don't think women really want to advertise like, hey, all original parts still. <laughs> <laughs> so they might be lying anyways, right? <laughs> all right, what else we got here? Children's and parents. This is a, actually a good one. You know, parents, obviously very, very um, <coughs> deeply passionate about their children. They should be anyway. So, you know, if you can target parents and the things that uh, their kids are doing, like soccer and sports and stuff like that, then, um, you know, that's, a, that's definitely a good niche to get into. And this is very easily targeted on Facebook. You can just choose to, you know, target people that are parents that have children. So if you can find parents and something that their kids are doing, and target them with a shirt, that may be a great idea to uh, sell shirts to them. Ethnicities, we've tried some shirts like in like Spanish languages or Spanish phrases and things like that. Again, it's not something that we're very familiar with, so we've had a hard time kind of selling you know, ethnic ethnicity-based t-shirts, but um, we do know some of our Spanish students. I mean, they're just absolutely killing it. And if you know a different language or you know like, you know, uh, connected to a different ethnicity that uh, you can tap into sayings like that, you're probably going to find a lot less competition. So that may be worth checking out if, uh, if you have a kind of an insight into that. All right, so getting started, um, it's a simple business. That's basically it. You know, that's basically the, the gist of the business. It's not very complicated, but I think if you kind of take into consideration those points, right, those basics, if you understand those things, you can kind of... Um, you know, you're going to have a lot more success going forward. You're going to kind of, you know, shorten that curve to your first successful campaign. Okay, so before, we used to be able to use the graph search in a really cool way. And the graph search is still technically there. It just appears differently. And I hate it. I hate the way it looks now because the way it was, obviously, is you can type anything in that search bar, and then it would open up like, a, like this whole new looking interface. It wasn't the news feed. It was just the graph search, right? And it had all kinds of cool ways to segment that, that information that it returned. You can literally just type in interest, and Facebook will return all the interest that you can actually target on Facebook. This was great because it was going to show you interest that you were most likely connected to or interested in personally first. So your results for interest were going to be a lot different than somebody else's. Um, now, when you type in stuff in the newsfeed, all it does is return posts, people, groups, names, stuff like that, and it looks like it's still in the newsfeed. It's weird. I hate it. Has anybody experienced that? Like, I don't like the new graph search. They've kind of taken away a lot of our access to information, and I guess it's probably our fault. Um, us marketers ruined it for everyone. We're sorry, um, because you know the the the, the graph search. They put all that information in the HTML of the page. It was all in the, in the source code. So all we people got smart and they're like, well, I'll just grab that information with software. And that's what we did. That's where scrapers came from. You know, scraping the graph and creating custom audiences based on those. That was awesome. That was so awesome. It was like, oh, please let this, this continue because it's too easy. It's almost too easy to just take all the information we want, tell Facebook, take it, put it in a custom audience and then target them specifically. It was so much easier than trying to go through the ads manager, right? Of course, that's gone because we ruined it. We ruined it. <sighs> okay, so now we basically teach that, you know, it's, you gotta go into the ads manager, right? And you gotta type in and see what's returned. And, and what stinks about that is it doesn't really show you all the results. So you can put in like, go into interest in your ads manager, like you're creating an ad and type in A, and it's going to show you like five results that have A. Like some of them may not even start with A. Um, you know, so on and so forth, B, C. Just type in one letter and see what it shows you, right? And that's going to show you some of the broader niches, which may or may not be a good idea. Uh, so you really kind of, it's, it's a little harder to find out what 
precise interests we can actually target on Facebook until we start digging in. And if you have an idea such as golf, you can kind of go into and, and type in golf into the interest and see what other results it returns and see if you know you can find large groups. So if you click golf and you see that it's like a 300 million people, that's a pretty large demographic to target on Facebook. So we can niche that down. It's definitely one that you can niche down and find pockets of uh, interest. Uh, the next step, uh, once you find that niche on Facebook that you want to target, you know you can target them because you've already kind of dug into the interest and in the precise interest in the ads manager. Uh, what, what I learned from Chris actually is research in this niche for profitability. So we'll go to e eBay and Amazon and we'll just type in that niche and see what returns. So this is pretty easily, most likely you're going to find, uh, you're going to find products that are returned in that niche and you're going to see what people are buying. You're going to see top sellers. You may find ideas from books, from titles, from other products in that niche. So we're going to go see if people are actually spending money on this niche. And Amazon is a great way to do that. And then, you know, once you know that it's a niche that you can target on Facebook, you know that people are spending money in this niche, we kind of use other sites like Zazzle, Amazon, Wanello, Pinterest, Google Images, and other blogs to kind of research that niche and find the expressions that people are are you know talking about or using uh, the lingo, speaking the lingo of that particular niche. So form, <coughs> forms is probably one of the best ways. It's probably the most labor intensive because you really <coughs> got to dig in and find people what they're talking about, read through a lot of posts and threads and stuff like that. But if you just go to Google Images and you type like golf expressions, golf sayings, and then type, you know, look at the images, look at the, the sayings, because there's a lot of stuff in, in certain niches and you'll find shirts, you'll find, uh, apparel sites, they already have shirts made, so you can get a lot of ideas from shirts, and you really just take those exact phrases and just make them your own shirts. So find the interest, see if it's profitable, and then we're going to find the exact um, sayings that they're using or, or phrases that we could use uh, to sell them a shirt. <coughs> then, of course, we just have to design that shirt. And again, it doesn't have to be very fancy. We don't use a lot of colors. Some of our top sellers have been Black t-shirts with white font. That's it. Very simple. And I found that we try to steer away from this, maybe make them a little bit different, and we're just like, oh, we should just do black and white. Even ones where we use like little images or um, like logos or things of that nature, it's just a white. It's just all white, not color. And not only is that cheaper, it's just different. It's just plain, and they seem to sell really well. But of course, you do want to be different. Uh, than the next guy. So designing something in a, in a unique way is obviously better. Uh, if it's going to be something that people are going to buy, you know, still there's that, that, that line you got to straddle there, you know, being different and being kind of simple, right? Just keeping it simple. Uh, once we have all of that, we have our design, we have everything ready to go, we definitely want a conversion tracking pixel. We want to know if people are actually buying this shirt, right? And we can easily do that with Facebook. Um, if you're not familiar with that, go into your Facebook ads manager on the left-hand side, it says conversion tracking, right? You click on that, you'll, crea you'll create your pixel uh, based on checkouts if you want to find uh, out if people are buying this, and they'll give you a pixel. And most platforms will allow you to take that pixel ID and just put it on your campaign so that you can figure out if people are actually um, buying your shirt. And so what you'll do when you're running ads is there's an advanced section uh, where it's a little drop down where you can actually select that conversion tracking pixel. So when you're running ads to that niche right, with the shirt and you select that conversion tracking pixel, that they know that if that person clicked on that particular ad, they went to that shirt campaign and they bought, an event is actually triggered on Facebook and Facebook lets you know that a conversion happened. So we definitely want to know that because then we can also look at who's buying our shirts and then kind of hone in our ads based on that information. Okay, the setup of the campaign is very straightforward. Um, these platforms are very, very simple to use. We just upload our image, we'll select the colors, whatever styles we want. Uh, the title copy, I don't know if Chris is going to get into the actual copy of uh, the, the uh, campaign itself, but we keep it very simple and we use the exact same copy every time. You'll notice all of our shirts have the exact same copy. We copy and paste it, we change the title to, to match the shirt, and that's it. Same thing with sales, uh, goal, and pricing. Uh, pricing, we, we keep it the exact same price every time. For hoodies, t-shirts, we've 
played around with different pricing options right around the same price to kind of figure out which actual price works the best. And uh, the sales goal too. So there's really no, there's not that much incentive to set a high goal. Unless you know this is a shirt that's already sold multiple times, setting a high goal doesn't necessarily pay off. Uh, we like to set it nice and low at 10, 10 or 20 shirts, especially if you're just testing out a new idea. Attention please, Anyone? attention please. Is that the it? fire alarm is about to be tested. <laughs> I was warned about this. <laughs> Thank you, like, that's it. So uh, retargeting on is re creating a retargeting link. Uh, attention please, attention please. Oh. The fire alarm is about to be tested. Please take no action. Fine, fine, don't move, folks. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, good timing, I guess. Uh, retargeting link, creating that retargeting audience on Facebook. I think this is uh, critically important. There isn't anything that we put on Facebook that we're not retargeting on. <sighs> What's this close to finishing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How long does this last, guys? A couple minutes? Four hours. Nice. Should I go? Good? Okay. All right, so everything that we do on Facebook has a retargeting link, or we're sending it to our own page, and therefore we're retargeting it there, right? So we, we can't like stress this enough. Always, always, always retarget, because even if they don't buy, like we run shirts in the same niche, right, over and over again, and we may get a lot of traffic, we may get a lot of clicks, uh, but for one reason or another, it doesn't sell. At least if we're building that retargeting audience, we might get a couple hundred people added to that list of that particular niche. So then when we sell another shirt in the same niche, we're gonna retarget those same people. And that niche audience is gonna continue to grow. It's kind of like an email list, but on Facebook. So that's gonna make it easier to sell shirts because we're really gonna hit that same audience over and over again. And Therefore, even if you lose $10 on a campaign because it just wasn't a winner, at least you know, you're, you're building that retargeting audience and uh, you'll get some use out of it later, so it's not a total loss. Oh, yes, so close. Yeah, that's it. So right at 10. Once we have all this set up, the Facebook posts, we do a page post engagement ad. Same, the same thing every time. Same title, very short. Uh, the image, call to action. That's it. And we run ads to that. So that's about it. I think I'm out of time, apparently. <laughs> Telling me it's time to go. They're like. Good.